My name is Martin Moroni, I'm a carbon scientist with Forestry Tasmania and I'm going to talk to you about carbon substitution which is the real carbon value in forest management. Um, my outline will be talking about climate change in forests where carbon is found in Tasmania's forests and the role of forests in greenhouse gas mitigation followed by a discussion on the values of reservation or active management for greenhouse gas mitigation and of course some conclusions. So the greenhouse effect can be simplified into short wave radiation in the form of light striking the earth, warming it, and then it emits long wave radiation in the form of heat back out to space. In much the same way as your radiator emits long, long wave radiation and you can feel it with your hands. But some of that radiation gets trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and of course if we produce more of them we increase that trapping of energy and we heat the earth as a consequence. One of the major greenhouse gases is carbon dioxide. So wood exchanges carbon with the atmosphere or trees exchange carbon in the atmosphere and they store it in wood and 50% of the dry weight of wood is carbon for that matter 50% of the dry weight of anything organic is carbon whether it be yourself or anything in your garden and one ton of carbon can be absorbed in about four meters cubed of wood and if we burn that meter cubed of wood we release about 3.7 tons of CO2 because the carbon has to combine with the oxygen in the burning process here's a picture of a very large pile of wood it's about a million meters cubic cubes of wood or about a quarter of a million tons of carbon this wood is from the salvage logging exercise of an insect outbreak in western North America I want you to be impressed that this is a very very large pile of wood so now to put this into context with the global fossil carbon emissions in 2010 they've been recently estimated to be about nine gigatons of carbon from the burning of fossil fuels fossil fuels are carbon stores that are geologically isolated from the atmosphere deep under the ground and we extract them and burn them in the form of petrol, diesel, uh, LPG, oil, all these things are fossil carbon uh, emissions when we burn them and extract them and we add them to the atmosphere. Now if we wanted to absorb that amount of emission from fossil sources into wood we'd have to generate a wooden cube 36 billion meters cubed or 36 kilometers cubed every year to absorb that or if you wanted to release the same amount of emissions as we do from the burning of fossil fuels we'd have to burn that much wood or we'd have to sequester that amount of carbon into that large pile of wood 36,000 times every year or we'd have to produce a two before that wraps around the earth at the equator over 300,000 times every year now the point being is that this is impossible we can't grow that much wood we can't continue to grow that much wood indefinitely and we must focus instead on reducing the amount of fossil fuels being emitted here is a recent publication describing the amount of whether the carbon sources from the industrial revolution and you'll see that the emissions from deforestation which is the conversion of a forest to a non-forest are estimated to be 15 to 20 percent so I've shown about 17 and a half percent with the remainder coming from fossil fuels again the emphasis is the main problem is the burning of fossil fuels not what's happening on the landscape however the landscape is important 17.5% is not insignificant and forests can exchange carbon with the atmosphere. Forests store carbon in both the above and the below ground in the living and the dead uh, organic matter pools. A sink is when these pools are increasing in their carbon stocks and of course a source is when they're emitting it back to the atmosphere. And that depending on the stage of stand development, a stand, a forest stand can be either a source or a sink, not just a sink as we're often told. And the net balance of a forest is then determined as the sum of each individual stand that comprises that forest in that landscape. So if we now look at the at a typical uh, dynamics of carbon after a disturbance, we see that forests after they've been disturbed, whether it be harvested or burned or killed by insects, you lose the photosynthetic apparatus of the leaves that reduce or take the carbon from the atmosphere. But we still have a lot of organic matter on site and that decomposes slowly with the, organic, with the microorganisms and emits carbon. So after a disturbance that affects the, the, uh, the stand, kills the stand, that the decomposition processes continue, they're larger than the photosynthesis sequestration of carbon and we end up with a carbon source, probably for the uh, period of time roughly in the order of a decade. Revegetation establishes, the forest starts to grow quickly and the the carbon absorbed into the forest through the foliage 
exceeds that loss through decomposition and the forest becomes it transitions to a sink again. But as it grows old, it, the trees get only to be so large, they don't grow indefinitely, they tend to become carbon neutral, maybe even being a slight carbon source. So if we understand what the shape of that curve looks like for an individual stand and we know the distribution of the ages of individual forest type on our landscape, we can simply multiply the area of a forest at a particular age by the carbon content at that age and we can get an estimate of the carbon content of that age class on the landscape. And if we want to understand the landscape, we do that for every single age class and forest area type for every type of forest on the landscape and we can get an estimate of the amount of carbon in a landscape. This is a process that's commonly done internationally and it has been done in, a, in Australia as well including into the, in Tasmania. Generally speaking, if we have a forest with a given age class and we allow that forest to become younger such that we have uh, harvesting regimes or natural disturbance regimes that increase in their intensity in that landscape, we will make that forest move or probably become a carbon source or at least we reduce the sink of that forest because we're moving forests from large carbon stores to lower carbon stores. Conversely, if we allow forests to age, generally speaking, we shift them into larger carbon stocks, the forest becomes a sink or it becomes more of a sink or less of a source as we allow forests to age. So now if we think of where carbon is in Tasmania's forests, we have a complex mosaic of forest types. We've got wet for eucalypt forests, dry eucalypt forests, and temperate rainforest. And I'm going to talk to you about only that portion managed by Forestry Tasmania, which is 36% of all of Tasmania's forests. I ask a question about iconic forests, where I ask what proportion of forests look like this, and that is described by forests that are dominated by 55 meter tall trees with high crown cover, so there's not very many gaps between the, the crowns of the trees. And I ask people to comment on whether it's a proportion or a percentage of land cover, whether it falls into these categories of greater than 60% to less than 1%. A lot of people, when they guess this, would guess between 1% and 60%. Some even guess even higher. The actual answer is 0.2%. Forestry professionals generally overestimate the amount of these types of forests by 10 to 50 times actual. The general public, and I've asked two to three thousand people generally overestimate the abundance of these forest types by fifty to three hundred times actual. The reason is twofold, I believe. Firstly, scientists have focused disproportionately on these forest types because they're iconic and very, very attractive to research, meaning that they're, they're represented disproportionately in the literature. Green groups also continuously provide these illustrations of Tasmania's forests when they discuss them. So people have an expectation that these forests are actually more abundant than they actually are. The tree shown in the images on the left includes the tallest hardwood in the world. It's about 100 metres tall. All the other trees are at least 85 metres tall and are amongst the best of the best of our forests, probably the best 0.001%. Wet eucalypt forests in Tasmania start off growing, as this diagram shows, and increasing in height and eventually they get a, a, a rainforest understory. This diagram accurately shows with the years since disturbance on the very bottom the development of much of our wet forest systems. Importantly what I'd like you to focus on is that the dimensions of the rainforest that replaces the eucalypt forest are smaller both in terms of height and diameter. Meaning that over time the wet forest will transition to a forest type that will store less carbon in it. It's demonstrated by looking into this uh, edge of this forest. What we have uh, are trees that are all the same age. The overstory trees and the understory trees are all the same age. They were all born of a fire that swept through this some time ago. The eucalypt forest is a hardwood forest and in, different from the rest of the uh, hardwood forests in the, in the world, it's open. A lot of sunlight can move through the canopy and you can get an understory develop, a thick understory. If you go to North America or to Europe, the rainforest overstory is, is complete and the, uh, the understory is open. It's easy to walk through. It's probably got grasses, uh, mosses, ferns in the understory, not a thick understory vegetation like we see here. What this means is that over time, the understory can develop. And with time, anywhere in Tasmania where you have a wet forest, when the seed from a rainforest can, just, can spread to there, you'll end up with a rainforest. Now this might take a very long time for wet forests that are far away from a rainforest, but eventually, with no fire, this would happen. 
So we would lose the largest, most carbon-dense trees in the forest, and that would be replaced by much shorter forests. Now, the one, the, the mixed forest that you're seeing in the, in the image is sassafras with a very large eucalypt overstory. There are a couple of things that I want you to notice. One is the eucalypts are all the same age. They're all born from the last fire. You might find forests that have two or three different um, ages of eucalypts where there was incomplete death of the overstory with the fire. But you won't find the situation that you see in the understory where you see a range of trees of different ages. There are all kinds of ages and there are very young, if you look closely you can see some seedlings. And this is because the eucalypt requires the seed to have mineral soil and it requires opening above it, a large opening. But the rainforest doesn't. The rainforest can grow in shade, it can grow on the litter. So if you're ever walking through a mixed forest, you'll notice that the rainforest species are the only ones growing on down logs. They're the only ones that are growing on large accumulations of litter. You won't find a eucalypt growing on a down log, and you won't find a, eucalypt, a young eucalypt in the shade of, of the forest, like you do the rainforest species. Except on the edges of roads, where, where, the, where roading has involved the cultivation, or the cutting of the soil with machinery that emulates the, the wildfire. With time, without wildfire, the eucalypts will die. The only evidence will be the dead wood, the stumps and the dead trees, and after some, other, some additional decades, they will disappear completely. But a large proportion of Tasmania isn't even this type of forest. It's a dry eucalypt forest. The, the, the example shown shows the forest is as big as it will be. It will never be the gigantic dimensions of the huge wet eucalypt forest that we can have. And the data that I'm presenting now is from about 4,000 data points. You can see on the left-hand side the carbon density in tons of carbon per hectare, so some of our forests have very large stocks of almost 500, and on the right-hand side the squares are the area in thousands of hectares, so the, from zero to 125,000. So the bars represent the carbon in tons per hectare. Now this is a lot of data, but I shall break it down. Here we see the mature forests, and you'll notice that a large proportion of the forests don't get to be the very carbon-dense forests of the forest class 1. You'll also notice that the, the carbon density is going in, in decreasing uh, waves right across the, the figure. We are showing that the tallest, most, the tallest, densest forests gradually getting shorter and shorter and shorter as we move to the right, and you'll see that pattern repeat itself. Now we see the fire-affected forest. Now this is where we can see from aerial photographs young forests typically less than 110 years old, that have been affected by wildfire. You'll notice, importantly, that the size of the columns or the bars is approaching the size of mature forests, where we can't see any evidence of recent fire. That's because we haven't had large landscape level fires in Tasmania for some decades, and the most of the forests have regrown considerably since they were burned. In the blue, we see the areas that are harvested. And you'll notice that some of the harvested forest types generally store lots of carbon, largely because of the, the, the relatively large area that has been affected. And also we have uh, non-euclid forests, which is basically rainforest and wattle-dominated forests. Now, the, of all these, this variety in our forest, the one circled in black is the one that receives the most attention. Yet you'll notice that the area is very, very small. So we don't have a very good representation of the discussion of Tasmania's forests in the public debate. We should focus more broadly on the big variety of forest types, productivity types, and, and um, potential heights within the forest, rather than the most iconic, relatively rare, tall forests. Now, if we simply multiply the area by the carbon content, we end up with the carbon, carbon content in total on the whole estate in millions of tonnes. The area hasn't, hasn't changed. And what you'll notice is that trees that are not particularly tall in the middle of the red column store the most carbon because they represent the largest area. And you'll notice if, that the area circled is a relatively small contribution to the entire carbon stocks in Tasmania's forests. It's not to say they're not important, but the notion that we can prevent or drop, dramatically reduce our carbon emissions by preventing the management of those forests is simply wrong just because they don't represent a large enough area. We have large areas, larger stocks of carbon in some of our forest types that have been previously burned, in some of our forest types that have been previously harvested, simply because there are larger areas of them. We even have larger, larger carbon stocks in our 
shorter rainforest because of the large area of those forests. Now if we simplify it even further, in standing trees, including the live and the dead trees, we've got about 163 million tonnes of carbon in state forest. This is dominated by the wet eucalypt forest, a little bit because it's more abundant than dry forest, but because, mostly because the dimensions of the trees are much, much larger. The dry eucalypt forest stores 41 million tonnes of carbon and the rainforest about 17. Now, if we could make all eucalypt forests simultaneously mature, we could add 65 million tonnes of carbon to the estate. But this will be absolutely impossible because we can't stop wildfire that prevents this from occurring. Interestingly, if we wanted to maximise carbon stocks in our forest, it would lead to the perversions of converting forest types. We know that wherever there is a rainforest or a wet eucalypt forest, they can, one or the other could, could occur there. And we've seen uh, naturally these transitions occurring and it's been done scientifically and demonstrated uh, that you can convert one to the other. If we converted our rainforest to our eucalypt forest, which would be a wet eucalypt forest because the dimensions go up, we could add 28 million tonnes of carbon to the estate. Now it would take a number of centuries, but it could be done. Luckily no one is talking about this type of conversion. However, if we attempted to stop the wildfire that would burn a forest as it matured and release the carbon stocks and regenerate it to a younger forest, if we tried to stop this process, in Tasmania the wet eucalypt forests would all transition progressively to rainforest and in so doing they would lose 50 million tonnes of carbon. So we have a paradox occurring in that in order to keep these very large carbon stocks or these forests that support these large carbon stocks on the landscape, they have to be burned and regenerated, whether it be by wildfire or whether it be by silviculture. And so we can't just simply stop disturbances and preserve these forests on the landscape because they're not stable climax communities. The eucalypt forest grows very, very quickly and is typically disturbed, grows very, very quickly and the, the cycle repeats. If you don't do that, the eucalypts will disappear, the wet eucalypt forests will disappear from the landscape because they require fire and they will be replaced by something else that stores less carbon. Now if we look at the carbon stocks on average in about 900,000 hectares of eucalypt forest on the estate and we include soil which, from which we have very little data and so the soil data requires checking with more data. But if we take what from what we have and we assume it to be representative of the estate then for about 900,000 hectares of eucalypt forest we've got about 340 tonnes of carbon per hectare in those forests. It's dominated by the live tree and the soil. You'll notice a very small amount in the dead standing trees and a relatively, relatively uh, small or medium sized pool in the woody debris. Tasmania's forests, or the Southeast Australian forests, are one of the three most fire prone forests in the world. And so when we see this low amount of dead standing trees, it tells us that we haven't had much large scale wildfire in our forests. It means that if we come back to a period of time after we had a relatively large amount of fire in our forests, say, after the 67 fires, the 34 fires, the 1898 fires, we would expect the live tree to be wound back and the dead tree to be wound up. What this is telling us is that we haven't had much fire in our forest, that our forests have regrown and we are ready for another large, -scale land, large landscape level fire. So the role of forest and greenhouse gas mitigation is what I'd like to move on to now. We're often told of forests as carbon safes, carbon banks that they need to be locked up. Whether this is intended to or not, it gives people the impression that forests are a static system that just absorb carbon. But as it's been described, this is not the case. Forests give off and sequester carbon. And so we must think of them as a, as a dam, as something like dynamic, like a dam, where you have inflow and outflow. And if you think about it in terms of a dam, as we put more and more water in the dam, the dam level rises, the surface area of the dam increases and then the losses from evaporation go up. This is analogous to what happens when we try to store carbon in a, in a forest, especially a disturbance driven forest. As the forest stores more carbon, the pro probability of fire goes up and losses from fires go up. Now if you think of the height of the dam wall as the, the maximum amount of carbon that could be stored biologically in that forest, or carbon carrying capacity perhaps, it'll never be attained by the, because of wildfire the activity of wildfire in that forest. But landscape carbon storage is only part of the story. We've also got options for the forest sector that involve the wood products. Globally, wood products transfer about 750 million tonnes of carbon 
into wood products to meet society's needs. And in Australia, it's about 8 million tonnes from about 25 million metres cubed of wood harvested. So mitigation options inc include longer retention of carbon in harvested wood products, the increased use of wood, so we can use more wood products, displace other products and use wood instead. Or we could even use woody biofuels to substitute off the, the fossil fuels. And substitution is something that I'll talk about later on. If you think about wood products and the carbon stored within it, in Australia, in millions of tonnes in service, being uh, wood that's being used in, in the fashion that it was designed, store 96 million tonnes in 2005. They are being generated at about 5.3 million tonnes of carbon per year with a net increase of 1.5 million tonnes of carbon per year because there are losses from wood products. They are, like forests, not immortal and a wood product will eventually be decomposed or burned uh, at the end of its life. In landfill, in 2003, Australia had 144, 140 million tonnes of carbon stored in disposed wood products. They are accumulating in a net rate of 2.5 million tonnes of carbon per year. It's according to these authors. If you look globally now, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations has produced estimates that wood products are increasing at a net rate of 71 million tonnes of carbon per year and landfill at 44 million tonnes of carbon per year. The solid wood products, which is wood used for furniture or, or framing or construction, if you take into account all of the emissions associated with the production, transportation, refinement, construction, deconstruction and end of life, those products are sequestering 27 million tonnes of carbon globally. But if we include the paper product chain, which stores carbon for less amounts of time, they're emitting 135 to 162 million tonnes of carbon. So to produce wood products for society, we're having emissions of a bit over 100 million tonnes of carbon. Now this makes sense if you think about it. We use fossil fuels in our, in our machinery, we use fossil fuels in the buildings that support the, the staff that work in this industry. So you would expect an emission. The reason why the wood products chain is sequestering carbon is simply because our population is growing and we have more and more wood products being produced to service that increasing demand. But that's not even the main game. The main game is actually dealing with substitution. The Food and Agricultural Organization describes it well and basically when we, when we go to, to produce something we can use a range of materials. Those materials are associated with different greenhouse gas emissions. So if we stop using one product that uses, emits a lot of carbon and we go to another product like wood that reduces relatively low amounts of carbon, we have an emissions, emissions reduction or a saving due to the substitution effect, substituting wood with another product of higher emission. This is recognised as having the, one of the greatest long-term benefits to greenhouse gas mitigation with forest management because we are substituting and preventing an emission and because we can't go back in time to unprevent it, the emissions that are prevented accumulate over time. There's a, a very large opportunity for substitution, but with not a lot of, lot of, not, not a lot of data available for many of, the, many of the activities that can occur. One area where there is a lot of data, or a significant amount of data, is in residential dwellings. Basically, the, some meta-analyses have shown that one tonne of carbon in wood prevents 3.7 tonnes of CO2 from being emitted. Based on these meta-analysis, another study has shown that in 2006 alone, the use of wood in residential dwellings prevented 135 million tonnes of CO2 from being emitted if wood were, were displaced by other materials. And the FAO estimated that in 2007, based on the above numbers, 483 million tonnes of CO2 emissions were prevented from the use of wood over alternatives. If you now go to the New England area of the, of the United States, the website shows the carbon that can, can be stored in a forest in products and the substitution effect. Because forests saturate, you see a blue line being generated by the amount of carbon that can be stored in the forest. Because wood products, some wood products are long-lived, the wood products carbon store will accumulate for a while and that's shown uh, just above that blue line. But you'll notice that the substitution effect very, very quickly becomes larger than the carbon stored in the forest and the wood products combined. And the graph that's shown shows from 2000 to 2165, so the time, that gives you an indication of the time frame. And the back of the envelope estimation from Tasmania's forests shows something very, very similar. So with time, the best way to reduce emissions is to use wood over alternative products. So we need to think of greenhouse gas mitigation with forest management, not just focusing on the forest. We need to think about the carbon stored in the forest as well as carbon stored in wood products. 
but we also need to think of the substitution effect. Now, carbon storage in a forest can be thought of as a dynamic pool, like a dam. So too can the carbon stored in wood products, because wood products are produced, but they are also burnt or decompose at, at some time. So as we produce more wood products, just the same as for forest, the probability that the losses from wood products will occur goes up as we produce more and more. However, we can take carbon or products from the forest and we can recycle wood products in society and use those instead of alternatives and have a substitution effect. And that, that can be thought of as having a prevented emission put into a safe because we can't travel it back in time and reverse that. So we can think of a substitution effect as a substitution safe that accumulates prevented emissions. And if you think about it, what the IPCC wants us to do is to completely substitute the burning fossil fuels with renewable alternatives such as wood. So now if we think about reservation and active management, we have to be mindful that the IPCC projects relatively large temperature changes over the, the coming decades for the whole of the world. And it is in this setting that we are often discussing the storage of carbon in forests. However, if we do try to store carbon in forests that are subject to this type of temperature change, we have to be mindful that that will invoke a change in our ecosystem. There are a number of publications presented. Here is one that shows the distribution of ecosystems in British Columbia on the west coast of North America. We have climate change redistributing these, these ecosystems. You don't need to know what they are, just that they are very, very different in their distribution. These forests will become increasingly maladapted uh, to their climate. The probability that they will store carbon, additional carbon, might be there in some instances, but in many instances, the forests are likely to become younger as they try to transition to the, uh, the new areas where the climate becomes suitable for their growth. But fire will also be, be a major player in these changes. Here is a historical look at the fire in Tasmania, put together by CSIRO. And in Tasmania, are famous fires are the 67 bushfires, which are thought of as being large. They burn about, in this estimate, about 175,000 hectares. However, it seems that these fires are just medium-sized. Megafires in Tasmania might be in the order of a million hectares. A published estimate for the 1934 fire is between 800 and 900,000 hectares. If this sounds remarkable, we just have to think of Victoria, a neighbouring state, where since 2003, 3.5 million hectares of forest have burned. In Australia, our plantation estate was recently estimated to, at best, sequestering 11 to 30 million tonnes of carbon per year. However, just two fires in Victoria, in 0304 and 0607, we're estimated to burn 3 million hectares and release 150 million tonnes of carbon, which is more than a decade of the net sequestration of our entire national plantation estate. We have since had a large, another large fire in Victoria. There have been large fires in New South Wales as well. Fires drive the carbon dynamics of Australia's forests, not harvesting. Here is a picture of Hobart showing it burned. It looks much, much different now, but you can still see the, the dead standing trees from this fire. And it reminds us that fire um, burns our forest, but also you can see in this image that there are houses that have been burned. It took some lives in this particular uh, 1967 fire. As we try to store carbon in our forest, we're storing biomass. That biomass is the feedstock for wildfires. And we can't separate managing forest for carbon and the outcomes that, we will, ha that will happen for fire. And we must be mindful of that. And in Australia, our fire, uh, fire hazard is expected to increase with climate change. We also be, must be mindful that Australia imports wood. If you go onto the government website, you'll see that every year we're importing between 600 and 900,000 metres cubed of sawn wood to meet our annual wood supply and much larger quantities of paper. Our net, Australia's net deficit in wood is about $2 billion, and that's imported, that's, we meet that from importing wood. From, largely from Southeast Asia. A recent study has shown that 2.7 million hectares of Southeast Asian forests were cleared to meet Australia's net wood demand. And many of these forests are managed to lower standards, which means that there's probably more intensive and the and management there is associated with larger emissions than it would be if it was done domestically. There's also extra freight to bring that wood to our markets and that's also associated with emissions from fossil fuels. So reservation Im implications include less forest health and monitoring because well, there will be a loss of the revenue from wood to support that sort of expertise. It will be harder to fund fire suppression and control. 
there will be less forest professionals to study the forest and pick up changes in, di in disease and insect distribution, perhaps the myrtle rust for example. We'll have increased the reliance on timber imports. However, if we go to manage our forests, a proportion of our forests should be managed or could be managed to produce wood products. We'll be more self-reliant, there'll be less imports. There'll be investment and employment in the forest industry. There'll be greenhouse gas mitigation benefits associated with the produ production of wood products that would, would uh, support and create markets, investment and employment. These revenues would also fund forest management, the regulation required to keep forest management practices sustainable, the monitoring which would also serve that purpose, as well as fire suppression. And there are a couple of opportunities that I'd like to raise to you in terms of engineered wood products and biomass fuel. <coughs> Further that uh, in Tasmania, native forest management recently supported greater than 50% of the forest workers. It provided $585 million in final wood products value for the year 2010-11. Uh, the contribution of the paper industry to the state of Tasmania is 1.2 to 1.6 million. And Forestry Tasmania's annual contribution to the Tasmanian economy is about $111 million per year. And since corporatization, corporatization about 17 years ago, Forestry Tasmania has, has paid approximately $100 million in taxes, rates and dividends to Tasmanians, according to these sources. Forestry Tasmania is legislated to provide 300,000 metres cubed of saw logs. It produces approximately 15,000 metres cubed of specialty timbers. and has about 12,000 kilometres of roads that provide access to tourism and recreational sites. And these forests are different from the national parks in that people can have campfires, they can take their dogs, ride horses, and it's all entirely free. Forestry Tasmania fights about 90 unplanned fires per year and, and has a range of staff that deal with forest health and monitoring. Now, if we considered the other the benefits of uh, possible future markets, in, in firstly in engineered wood products, first of all we think about the the processing of sawn timber, which requires relatively large pieces, about 40 centimeter in diameter. They have a low total recovery due to the uh, the sawmilling process, and they have a significant amount of drying time. However, we can peel wood that's relatively small, only 15 centimeter in diameter which means that we can have much shorter rotations both in our native forest and our plantations. And we can also use poorer quality wood. We can combine it with high quality wood and have a, have a um, recombine it into like LVL or cross veneer lumber and produce strong structural wood that incorporates the smaller pieces of uh, poor lower quality wood. Here are some examples of engineered wood that, are, that can be made. And they can, can, as described, use low quality logs. There's a higher recovery because we don't have so much sawdust generated and we can use larger portions of the log. These products are strong, they're stable and they're durable, and they have multiple applications. So we can start to substitute more and more products, use these products in more and more uh, examples of construction. And they have strong environmental credentials, not the least because they're associated with low carbon emissions. And they're sustainable and they're becoming very, very competitive. In Forestry Tasmania, the way we have a showroom where you can see some examples. All of the wood in this image are from uh, engineered wood, including the flooring, the table and the door. They're high strength, they're appearance grade. They can be used, of course, to make flooring, furniture and framing. They can be used for both interior and exterior products. And we can mix native forest and plantation wood together to make such products. Opening up the door to, uh, for many opportunities for many, very many uh, products or end users. And we're moving into second generation engineered wood in Forestry Tasmania that uh, are much improved, there's less residues, there's higher recovery and greater utilisation. Now if we think about biomass fuel and what I'm showing you is provided by Andrew Lang who's a board member of the World Bioenergy Association. So the picture shown uh, is of a, in the south of, is in Sweden, south of Stockholm. It's one of a series of similar plants being built across Europe. It produces 88 megawatts of power and 200 megawatts of thermal power. It's very efficient due to the use of the thermal heating of houses. So they pump hot water out uh, into a, a distribution, a centralised distribution. Uh, new plants are using rail to bring biomass over long distances, up to 400 kilometres, using an electric train. <coughs> it mostly uses native forest residues and is very, very efficient. 
It's rare to find a plant that produces under 10 megawatts of electricity and it requires specialist skills so it is associated with employment where the power plants are placed. Here is uh, in the next slide shows the equipment that's used uh, to gather the biomass. It's in central, south central Sweden. You are seeing a uh, compressing form of forwarder which is the yellow machine. What happens is you load the, the residues on and it, the, arm, the sides of the, the forwarder collapse in and squash it so you can put, place more on. Um, it's designed to carry lots of low density um, tree components uh, and it's an example of new equipment that's being built uh, by forestry machinery manufacturers and it's an example of how the bioenergy market is creating investment in R&D uh, and it reduces the cost of handling the low density biomass. The next uh, slide shows uh, Pellets in Sweden. This is a private sawmill uh, that are value adding. They have bought their own pellet making machine and are bringing in uh, residues from other mills, making the pellets and selling them on. Uh, what we see in the next slide is common in Europe. $4.5 billion have been spent in investment recently into renewable energy, largely into big plants dominated by uh, making fuel from woody, woody wastes. And these are replacing diesel and as well as some ethanol. It's a gasification synthesis pathway. It's second generation. It uses only residues, so it doesn't use crops grown for biomass energy that compete with fibre production or food production, as the first generation did. Um, the next picture shows a pelleting plant. It's a softwood sawdust, uh, 70,000 tonnes per year. And the vapour that you see coming out of the stack is from the drying process that's used to produce the pellets. The, the pellets. Uh, uses utilizes a lot of waste in Sweden, all the mill wastes. Um, the next slide shows uh, Sweden's climate uh, gas emissions, GDP, GDP growth, and bioenergy. And you'll notice that they're getting, they're reducing their fossil fuel emissions. Their economy is still growing, and it has very much mirrored the use of biomass energy. The target is to have biomass energy at 39% of total primary energy, energy that's the aggregate of heat, electricity and transport by 2020. They're currently at 32% and it looks like they will exceed it. They use more biomass energy than they do uh, energy from oil. And you would think that Tasmania could be in a similar place with similar types of investment. Um, in Sweden they closed down a 1,200 megawatt nuclear power plant. It was largely a, a political move, but they, this energy has been replaced by biomass energy, uh, mostly, f mostly from forest biomass. And in Denmark, we see uh, they've been investing in regional bioenergy for over 30 years. In Tasmania, this represents a missed opportunity. This is a, uh, the image shown is a 9 megawatt electricity, 30 megawatt thermal, thermal biomass energy plant uh, from about 50,000 tonnes of biomass. These are the sort of plants that we could have distributed around Tasmania that would provide regional employment in terms of running the, the equipment but also bringing the uh, residues to the plant. It's mainly fueled by straw but it would be easily changed to be fueled by wood chips. So biomass energy could supply about 20% of Australia's electricity, 30% heat or 30% transport fuels. It utilises wastes and residues. It could reduce landfill and smoke could be reducing landfill by diverting stuff that would be thrown into landfill from uh, residential dwellings into a biomass plant and it could reduce smoke by taking away from the, uh, the forest a lot of the residues that would be burned in the regeneration process that cause all the smoke that is problematic to a lot of people. It could add to the farm, forest and industry incomes regionally especially. It drives new green industries such as, a, as the production of new material, new machines and new products. It stimulates local economies and generates new permanent rural jobs. And it's, of course, associated with sequestration, particularly by the substitution effect. Biomass energy reduces regional and national greenhouse gas emissions. It provides baseload energy. So unlike a wind that can stop growing, it can provide constant baseload energy. It's scalable, meaning that it can provide small scale to large scale. It's sustainable and it is cost effective. Tasmania has a potential for about 100,000 hectares of farm forestry and that, that could provide biomass energy to generate electricity. 
while providing habitat, carbon offsets, round wood, jobs, biomass and shelter for stock, etc. So to conclude, we only care about carbon in forests due to climate change. Tasmania's forests are very, very diverse. Our very, very tall trees are reserved and they're unusual on the larger landscape. Forest carbon storage is important, but it's not permanent. In Tasmania, the best example of this is the, what happens when, the, when we have wildfire. Tasmania's forests are actually relatively old because we haven't had landscape fire in our system for a very long time. So they're probably in the upper age range or carbon storage range that we should expect. And a mega fire, when it occurs, will reduce carbon stocks in Tasmania's forests below what they are now. And it will take many decades for them to reaccumulate that carbon. We must abandon thinking of forests like a safe that they can be locked up, like a static system. And we must think of forests in a dynamic system, like a dam. We must recognise the role that wood products have in storing carbon within them, but in particular the substitution effect. We must recognise the new products and technology that are being deployed and the opportunities associated with them, that this is good for global, uh, the global warming by preventing the emissions, it's good for the economy and it's good for society. And if we want these things, we must support sustainable forest management. But in particular, we must avoid the worst possible outcome where we attempt to store carbon in the landscape by halting active forest management with landscape carbon returned to the atmosphere by wildfire with no products extracted and no carbon stored in wood products, no substitution effect, we import more wood associated with more emissions and have no benefit to society or the economy. Thank you very much.